Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for a webinar on decarbonizing hydrogen production. I noticed from the audience list, we have a lot of people from all over the world. So I'm going to give you a short introduction about the SUT. SUT stands for the Society for Underwater Technology. We are a multidisciplinary learned society. We bring together organizations and individuals who have a passion for underwater technology, ocean science, and offshore engineering. I forgot to mention, I am the, my name is Shruti Shudasan, and I'm the chair of SUT Plus Aberdeen. We are the subset of SUT for young professionals. We cater to students, graduates, and developing professionals working in the sector. Where are we based? As you can see from the location pins on this world map here, we have a global outreach with over 40, with members over from over 40 countries. And you'll be pleasantly surprised to find a branch in your country of residence. Some of the future events that we have planned for you are the virtual subsea awareness course. This is a 15 hour foundation level course, which will be run over five days. And some of the topics that will be covered in this course are subsea production export systems, pipelines, flow assurance, renewables, met ocean, just to name a few. The other event that we have in June is the fourth and final presentation in our virtual decommissioning series. In this presentation, Audrey Banner from OPRED would be giving us an insight into decommissioning from a regulator's perspective. This event will be taking place on the 16th of June and more details will be put on our website in the following weeks. And how can you get in touch with us? You can check out our website where information about all our future events will be put. And on LinkedIn, we have the latest postings about new events that will be happening. You can email us for more information. And on our YouTube channel, SUT Media, you will find information and recordings of all our previous free webinars. If you enjoyed this event and you've been following us for a long time, please support the society by being a member. You can email our membership and finance officer, Jane Hilton at jane.hilton at sct.org for more information. Before we start, I would like to inform you all that this presentation is being recorded, except the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Kindly mute your microphones and please do not share your videos as it affects the quality of the live broadcast. And yesterday I got a tiny peek into the presentation and I'm sure you'll have tons of questions. So please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask your, ask your questions throughout the session. And now I would like to in introduce our speaker for the event, Jamie Elliott. Jamie is the principal consultant in DNV's energy systems division. His 15 years of experience spans the entire oil and gas value chain from the well to the domestic meter, which he applies to help organizations safely navigate the energy transition. His work has included safety engineering for hydrogen fueling of buses and heavy vehicles. He was co-author on a report on net zero emissions for one of the world's largest sovereign wealth funds, providing insights on future trends in blue and green hydrogen, CCS, aviation, shipping, biofuels, e-fuels, and more. As part of the HINS project, Jamie developed a roadmap for the R&D required for a hydrogen trial on the National Transmission System, NTS. As you can hear from this introduction, he has a wealth of knowledge about hydrogen and whom better to learn more about hydrogen, an important energy source, which will be playing an important role in the future energy mix and decarbonization. Without further ado, I pass the virtual mic to Elliot, oh, sorry, to Jamie Elliot, and please tell us more about hydrogen and all the exciting projects that DNV has been working on. Thank you, Shruti. Okay, hopefully you can see my presentation now. 
Um, I'm yes. very pleased to be joining you today uh, to talk about decarbonizing hydrogen production. Um, so by way, uh, just of an introduction to the topic, uh, just setting the scene, as you'll probably be aware, um, the UK and other countries have set net zero targets to uh, help avert um, climate change. Uh, so the UK is set net zero for 2050 and the US, EU, China and many other countries are also setting ambitious targets to decarbonize our societies. And this is going to impact every aspect of our lives. So every home, every vehicle, every product we use will need to be decarbonized and the energy we currently use will need to change. And the ways we're going to do this will include energy efficiency. That's going to be a really important part. Um, electrification is going to be very important. Many things can be electrified. Um, I have an electric car. I think uh, that's, that's a great way to go for light vehicles. Uh, but for some applications, we will need hydrogen and we will need carbon capture and, and storage. And that's one, what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so some of the uh, drivers for introducing hydrogen uh, and the areas where it is likely to be used um, one of those is decarbonizing heating of buildings. Um, now we've got two options here. One is heat pumps, which I'll talk about as we, as we go through. Um, and the other is using our existing gas boilers, um, but having hydrogen boilers instead, um, which operates on very similar principles. Um, another um, area is mobility. So for light vehicles, we're likely to see electrification, um, but for heavier vehicles, so buses, HGVs, trains on non-electrified tracks, um, we are going to need hydrogen because um, of the amount of energy you can fit on the vehicle and the quicker refueling times. Uh, and also for shipping, we are, um, we'll talk about that, but we're likely to need ammonia, which again is derived from hydrogen. Um, the third area we've got here is um, valorization and storage of electric uh, excess electricity from renewables. So uh, it's fantastic that we have had a revolution in wind and solar um, providing us with plentiful and cheap um, energy, but that uh, is variable. It, um, it comes when it comes and we, our demand is also variable and um, potentially at different times to when the energy is being produced. So hydrogen is one way where we can store that energy until we need it. Um, and if we've got too much energy, um, if there's more wind blowing, for example, then there is use. Rather than losing that energy, we can, we can use it and capture it and use it later. Um, and the fourth application is um, uh, heavy industry and heat intensive processes. Um, so some processes actually need an open flame for the, for the process. Um, some processes, uh, you know, you might electrify, but for where we need high temperatures, um, it might be better to, to use hydrogen, to burning the hydrogen. Um, and we'll also talk about some processes that even um, notwithstanding the, the uh, energy and heat that you're putting in, uh, the process itself emits carbon dioxide. Um, and so we'll need carbon capture um, to, to capture that carbon dioxide. Um, so then that's the infrastructure for, for blue hydrogen, as we'll see. Um, so where are we getting our hydrogen from? There's two main sources. One is water, which is, as you'll know, H2O. So we're splitting out the, the O, the oxygen, and um, it's not a problem to discharge that to atmosphere, um, and we can keep the hydrogen. So that's from electrolysis. And the second uh, source of hydrogen is methane, which is the main constituent of natural gas. And we already get a lot of our energy from natural gas. Uh, so, so methane is uh, CH4, so we want the, the H4, the hydrogen, and we don't want the carbon, um, but we can't just discharge that to atmosphere. We need to capture and sequester that carbon permanently to have a decarbonized solution. So there are two routes, which we'll talk about more. Um, so we've got taking power and water using electrolysis to produce our hydrogen, and the de decarbonization is coming from the fact that the electricity is low carbon electricity from renewables. And then the other source is natural gas. We're reforming that natural gas to produce the hydrogen, 
and the decarbonisation is coming from the carbon capture and storage. Now, a big challenge for hydrogen, um, and it is still very much up for debate how much we will use it and where we will, we will use it, um, but we know we will need some of it. And one of the challenges is energy efficiency. So if we look at this waterfall graph, it shows you in green, if we had uh, one unit of renewable energy from wind, solar, or hydro, um, how much of that energy will we actually be able to use if we, for example, put it in a battery electric vehicle? Um, so it turns out we've got losses um, through transmitting the electricity uh, when we charge the vehicle and uh, losses in the motor and the mechanical transmission. And we end up getting about 69% of that energy is actually going into moving the vehicle. If we compare that to a hydrogen fuel cell, we have again, transmission losses, uh, but then a big loss when we're doing the electro electrolysis and during the logistics and filling of the hydrogen um, and in the fuel cell, and again, in the motor and the mechanical transmission. So we're only getting 26% of the energy of our renewable energy that we generated, only 26% is actually going into moving the vehicle. So um, other things being equal, we would prefer the battery electric vehicle, except for those applications, as I've said, where we can't get enough energy into the battery or the battery is too big and heavy um, for our particular application. Um, it's a similar story when we look at heating buildings. So uh, on the top right graph here, if we've got some low carbon or, or renewable energy from wind or nuclear, and we produce um, hydrogen in an electrolyzer and transmit it and put it in a hydrogen boiler and burn it, and we're getting about 70% of the energy is going into heat in our building. If we contrast that to a heat pump, um, we in a heat pump, we're taking the same amount of energy and putting it into the heat pump, but the heat pump is actually then taking energy either from the air, if it's an air source heat pump or the ground, if it's a ground source heat pump. And, um, and so it's actually two, 300% efficient. So for every unit of heat we, uh, of electricity, of energy in electrical energy, um, we might get two or three units of heat. And this isn't magic um, energy from nowhere, it's the energy is being taken from the, from the air or the ground. So, it seems like a heat pump would be the best solution, and they are used in, in um, some countries around the world, not so much um, where I am here in the UK uh, yet. Um, and there are big ifs and buts about this. It does depend on the outside air temperature. If it's an air source heat pump, it can be less efficient. Also, it can run, it will produce lower temperature water. So the user has a very different experience. So if, if you convert your central heating, to uh, a heat pump, you will have lower temperature radiators, which will need to be on more of the time. You need an energy efficient building that's not leaking all of the time. Um, so um, ideally heat pumps are gonna be a good solution, but in some cases, um, hydrogen is, is also going to be a viable solution. Um, and the big advantage of hydrogen, as I've mentioned, is the flexibility that it gives us. And um, so this is a graph of energy use in the UK from 2013 to 2015. So the blue line is gas energy, natural gas. The red line is electricity and the gray line is transport. So petrol, gasoline and diesel. Um, so you can see that the variability of electricity from the summer to the, uh, to the winter is about maybe a third uh, increase in the winter. Whereas if you look at gas, we're going from Five, less than 500 gigawatts to 3000 gigawatts. So it's maybe six times, five or six times variability from the summer to the winter. Um, and the other thing is, if we were gonna electrify all of this energy use, then we would need to um, increase the capacity of our electricity system by five or six times. So by using hydrogen, we can reuse our existing natural gas infrastructure. Um, and we can, if it's blue hydrogen, we continue, continue to get energy from natural gas and we can cope with this variability. So gas systems cope with variability in a few ways. Um, so variability through the day, we tend to use our energy in the morning to heat our houses and when we're having our, 
our showers in the morning uh, and in the evening when we're cooking and again heating our houses um, so that variability is coped with through actually packing the lines the pipelines are used to store energy and we increase the pressure uh, through say the night and then we can decrease the pressure draw grass, gas out of the system um, when we need it so it's very flexible and then throughout the year we're storing gas in the summer we're storing it in underground gas caverns we're storing it as, li as liquefied natural gas and we can also just produce less we can just turn off the tap and take less gas out of the um, underground reservoirs where it's coming from in the first place. So it's, it's able to deal with this variability. So this is one advantage of why uh, we may be using hydrogen to help us decarbonize. Um, so let's talk in a bit more detail about the different colors of hydrogen, gray, green, and blue. So for uh, gray hydrogen, we already are producing lots of this. Um, so this is uh, used, for example, for producing fertilizer, uh, for producing ammonia for fertilizer. Uh, hydrogen is, the, is the, uh, an input. And also in refineries, it's used um, for hydro desulfurization of fuels, so uh, producing low, low sulfur fuels. Uh, so gas is extracted, for example, um, in the UK, a lot of our gas comes from the North Sea, from uh, reservoirs underground and it's piped ashore and taken to a reformer. At the moment, that's a steam methane reformer. Uh, in the future, it could be an autothermal reformer. And we split the carbon and the hydrogen. And the carbon at the moment is just dumped to atmosphere. So there's a big carbon impact from that. And gray hydrogen is fed to consumers, which is fertilizer plants and, and refineries in the most part. So we can take that same system and produce blue hydrogen. So we already have a stream of separated carbon dioxide. And instead of blowing it to air, we can just take it back and put it in a depleted uh, oil or gas reservoir. And we've got lots of these uh, all around the world where we have taken out the oil and gas and we can just put back the carbon dioxide. And we know that it holds gas because it's held gas before we extracted it. It's held it for thousands or millions of years. And then uh, we can send that blue hydrogen to consumers uh, as uh, to the industry as before. Um, we can also uh, burn it in, in uh, boilers and we can convert it to ammonia as uh, shipping fuel. Um, so as I've mentioned, there's uh, traditional technology is steam methane reformers, but um, in the future we expect autothermal reforming. Um, to be the dominant use because we can get a better capture rates and it's more efficient. Um, the advantage of blue hydrogen, um, firstly, we've got all of this energy on, on tap coming out from under the ground, which we can continue to use um, until we have um, larger amounts of uh, renewables available. And also it's cheaper. So at the moment, um, globally, it's about $1.50 to $3 per kilogram compared to uh, three to seven and a half dollars for green hydrogen. Now that's coming down all the time, um, but at the moment the the blue hydrogen is cheaper. Uh, so we can get large amounts of hydrogen um, if using blue hydrogen. Um, it's not completely zero carbon though. We can get probably 99% capture rates with autothermal reforming, um, but there's also emissions um, throughout the uh, chain. So before the before we um, reform it, there's, there's leaks of methane um, that occur all the way through the system. And methane is itself a potent global warming gas. And one challenge is that, that this is a very um, large uh, monolithic value chain with high capex costs. And we're used to that in the oil and gas industry, but, but this is uh, even more capital is required to build out the carbon capture infrastructure. Um, and it's always going to be cheaper just to blow that carbon dioxide into the air rather than capture it. So it needs a funding mechanism, which has to come from the government. So either it's subsidy or it's carbon taxes. There needs to be either a carrot or a stick um, for the, for in some way for this to, this to happen. For, uh, companies are not going to uh, build this unless there is a uh, business case for it. So that's blue hydrogen. Green hydrogen is 
when we're producing hydrogen from renewable electricity via electrolysis. So that's power to gas. So the electrolyzer splits the water into hydrogen and oxygen. Um, so we can connect the electrolyzer uh, directly to the renewable supply. So for example, we've been involved in some projects where we're building an electrolyzer at a wind farm. Um, so the good thing is that we're not getting any um, electricity transmission losses uh, because the electrolyzer is uh, right next to the, where the electricity is being produced. Or if it's a small application, for example, a hydrogen filling station, um, it's quite handy just to be able to produce the electricity, the, the hydrogen on site. Um, so if we're plugging into the electricity grid, then we need to have certified green electricity um, or power purchase agreements to show that it's still uh, it's green electricity, even though it's coming from a grid with a mixture uh, of electricity sources. Um, so in some countries uh, where we've got both high renewable resources and high demand, um, then uh, so, for example, uh, in, in parts of Europe, we've got uh, lots of wind. In California, we, we might have solar. Um, then this can be a good option. And maybe more speculatively, we might think about um, places like the Sahara Desert, where there's a lot of sun, but then we'd have to produce our green hydrogen and, and ship it somewhere else, either by ship or pipeline. Um, so the advantage is uh, it's zero carbon. Yeah, as long as your electricity is green, then your hydrogen is green. And this is already mature. Uh, and being commercially operated. Uh, it's also getting cheaper all the time. So we, in our, in our uh, modeling, we are assuming an 18% cost learning rate for hydrogen. Uh, it, electrolysis produces very pure hydrogen. So um, unlike for blue hydrogen, green hydrogen can be used in fuel cell electric vehicles. Uh, and again, it gives us an opportunity to store our um, excess uh, renewable electricity, which we wouldn't otherwise be able to use. So at the moment, green hydrogen is more expensive. We expect it to um, get cheaper over time. Um, it does rely on the availability of renewable electricity, though. So there's no point doing this if the electricity is coming from a coal-fired power plant, for example. So we do have to have lots of renewable electricity to be able to do this. Um, and as I've said before, it's less efficient than electrification in many cases. So it's only going to be certain cases where uh, green hydrogen is going to make sense rather than electrification. So comparing green versus blue hydrogen, um, DMV produces an, uh, an energy transition outlook uh, forecast every year. And we're forecasting that um, at the moment, natural gas use will continue to be a dominant source of uh, energy um, <clears throat> and in the coming years blue hydrogen will be cheaper for new projects um, up to about the mid 2030s and then as we get beyond that towards 2050 new projects are more likely to be green hydrogen as that becomes the cheaper option um, the final piece in the puddle, puzzle is carbon capture utilization and storage so for uh, blue hydrogen we need to capture that carbon dioxide. Um, and the other place that we're capturing carbon dioxide from, uh, it could be from post-combustion capture. So we might be retrofitting post-combustion post capture to, um, for example, gas-powered, um, gas-fired power stations. And as I've said, um, things like cement facilities that inherently emit carbon dioxide. So we're going to need some carbon capture if we are building carbon capture uh, facilities, then that gives us the opportunity then to create blue hydrogen. And we can transport the CO2 by pipeline, and there's also some projects to transport it um, liquefied by ship. And we're sequestering it permanently underground. And I, I really like this picture from the Global CCS Institute, which just gives you a sense of scale of just uh, how far down we are actually storing this. Uh, and the many layers um, between us and the and the reservoir, and uh, it gives us just it helps us visualize why the geotechnical specialists are confident that we can safely store CO two underground. Um, it's often said that CCS is some um, mythical future technology. It really isn't. Um, technically, it, it is 
uh, very mature and there are 19 large CCS projects around the world with more under construction. And you can go and look this up uh, in the um, core database from the Global CCS Institute. So for example, Chute Creek in the USA um, is storing seven megatons per annum um, of carbon dioxide every year. And the Sleepner project in Norway has stored 17 megatons since it started operation. So technically, uh, it is a mature solution. The problem is all of these so far, or most of them have been for enhanced oil recovery. So it's paid for by putting gas into a reservoir that increases the pressure so then, then more oil comes out. So obviously that's not a climate change solution because we're getting more um, oil out and, and it ultimately having more carbon dioxide being emitted. Um, so the, the only thing that, C, that CCS is missing is the business case. Um, that has to come from the government. The US government has been quite successful in encouraging this enhanced oil recovery with tax credits. Uh, so it needs even more um, funding than that to produce uh, CCS where there's no enhanced oil recovery, where it's purely decarbonisation. Um, in the UK, uh, we have um, a series of industrial clusters which are responsible for a large um, chunk of our emissions. Um, and these are doing things like uh, chemicals, glass, paper and pulp, oil refining, iron and steel, ceramics, food and drink, and cement. And they're supporting lots of jobs. And uh, these industrial clusters have all been thinking about how they can decarbonize. And there are several CCS projects that are on the cards. So in Aberdeen, there's the ACORN project. This is also where most of the UK's gas comes ashore. Um, and so that's looking at uh, reusing um, reservoirs in the North North Sea. Uh, there's the Endurance Project in the Southern North Sea, which is looking at connecting both the Teesside and Humberside industrial clusters. And then Hynet is looking at CCS in uh, for Merseyside and um, the Northwest of England. Um, so there's there's plans um, well advanced for this, but it needs a business case for the final investment decisions to be made. Um, smaller hubs like South Wales and Southampton would have to export their CO2, so by ship or, or pipeline. <clears throat> okay, I'd like to talk about um, energy islands. I think this is something that's quite relevant to SUT um, for green hydrogen production offshore. Um, so there has been a huge revolution in offshore wind and large amounts of offshore wind have been built out and it's getting cheaper all the time. Uh, and it's now becoming viable to um, produce hydrogen offshore. So we don't suffer the transmission losses of uh, sending electricity ashore. There's, there's less energy loss in sending the hydrogen ashore. And we can capture that energy that's excess energy when there's too much wind and not enough demand. And this is an example of where skills from <clears throat> the oil and gas industry um, for where, which has been moving to subsea production in recent years, uh, can be useful for deploying hydrogen um, for these energy islands. And this, again, plans are well advanced for energy islands. So Copenhagen uh, Infrastructure Partners, which is um, a pension funds, <clears throat> are looking at investing heavily. We also have a North Sea Wind Power Hub, um, which is Denmark, Netherlands, and Germany. And the Aquaventus uh, consortium, which DMV is part of, is looking at solving some of the problems and challenges to do with deploying these systems. I'd also like to talk about hydrogen and ammonia as maritime fuels. So the, the problem with um, maritime is energy density. So for example, if, uh, if you have a container ship some of the space on that container is taken up by the fuel. And if you look at this chart on the right, diesel is by far the best and marine fuel oil is very similar to diesel. <clears throat> the alternative fuels are nowhere near as good. LNG um, is not decarbonized, but is likely to be used 
because it's lower emissions than marine fuel oil. And the other two options at the top of the list are methanol and ammonia, which are both derived from hydrogen. Liquid hydrogen itself and compressed hydrogen have much lower energy density, so we don't think they will be used um, as much. And lithium ion batteries come nowhere near. They're, they're way, way down. And so they're only going to be viable for very short routes, um, maybe for local ferries. Um, so we can either burn the methanol or ammonia, or we can use them in a fuel cell. There's no marine engines currently on the market um, capable of burning ammonia, but there is development underway. Um, there is existing infrastructure for handling ammonia uh, because we do this for uh, the ammonia for fertilizer. Um, fuel cells are mature for other applications, but again, not for maritime. And the problem is you can't just retrofit an existing ship. It, it, it has to have been designed from this from the outset, really. And ships have very long lifetimes um, of the order of decades, maybe 30, 30 years. So the ships that are being built today are not being built ready for ammonia and methanol. And those ships are still going to be the same ships in use in 2040, 2050. Uh, and at the moment, in incentives for investment are missing. So again, we need either carbon taxation or subsidies to change the fuel mix. Um, we do think of in future years, LNG will be, will be taking a greater share, uh, which will decarbonize shipping to some extent. Um, but uh, more needs to be done really to move shipping industry towards fully decarbonized fuels. Um, and then lastly, I'll talk about heating our homes with hydrogen and the high NTS future grid projects that DNV has been involved with. Uh, so um, hydrogen boilers already exist. And this is an example of uh, a hydrogen boiler by Baxi. Um, so we can use hydrogen uh, in just the same way that we use natural gas. So we can use it in boilers, we can use it on, in gas fires for heating, we can use it in ovens, and we can use it um, in stoves. The combustion of hydrogen produces H2O, so water. Um, there is also um, nitrogen oxide that can be produced the same as with um, combustion of other fuels because there's nitrogen in the air. So that has to be controlled. Um, in the EU, all existing boilers can already handle up to 23% hydrogen mixed with a natural gas. 100% uh, hydrogen ready boilers, um, fires and stoves have already been developed and they're ready. Um, there's not a market for them yet, but they are available and ready to go. And consumer trials have been taking place, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, it's good for consumers because the nothing changes for them. They can use their appliances exactly as they do and they won't notice a difference. So this is good for places like the UK, where 80% of homes are already on the gas grid, less so for places where there isn't an uh, extensive gas network. Um, so this is DNV's High Street facility, which is at our test site in Spade Adam. So it's in the middle of nowhere, so we can do all sorts of tests here, uh, safe in the knowledge that there's nobody uh, around, so it's out of harm's way. Um, so we have been testing, for example, what happens uh, if we get a hydrogen leak because it's more buoyant than natural gas. Um, so we're testing the safety of hydrogen in domestic settings. And then the extension to that is the, you can see the yellow pipes on this picture. So that's a low pressure gas distribution network, uh, small scale. But what that means is that um, the operators of the real gas distribution networks are going to bring their kit their pieces of pieces of equipment taken out of the real network. So for example, um, valves and filters, they can put them in our test network and they can practice their operational procedures. So they can practice burying them, digging them up, looking for gas leaks. Um, they can practice changing the equipment in and out, doing, doing leak tests uh, and do it in a safe environment and develop their procedures to be able to safely handle hydrogen and build a case that we can handle it safely. So that's low pressure distribution, which is local to your house. And then 
there's also high pressure transmission where we move gas from one part of the country to another or between countries. So we're also building a uh, transmission test network, which is high NTS future good project. And so that's going to be the latest extension to that project at Spade Adam. Um, so hydrogen is already in use. Uh, there are lots of hydrogen demonstration projects uh, taking place around the world. So for example, at Rosenberg, this was a project that DMV ran where 100% hydrogen um, was used to heat the, uh, to supply the boilers for heating in an apartment building in the Netherlands. Then in the UK, we had the high deploy uh, test at Kiel University. So this was a private distribution network, so not one of the public uh, distribution networks. So here they had um, 30 faculty buildings and 100 domestic properties, and they trialed 10% hydrogen blend, and that was yet last year. So that's already been conducted and successful. The extension to that then is Wynn Latin in Gateshead. So this is a small subsection of the real public gas distribution network. And it was chosen because this is an isolated section that can be separated from the rest of the network and this is a bigger test than 670 houses plus a local church primary school and several businesses and they've been given 20 percent hydrogen blend this year so as i said they don't need to change their appliances they won't notice um, the difference it all happens behind the scenes and they we can start to trial decarbonizing parts of part of their energy supply um it's and also in, in Australia this year, they're testing 5% um, hydrogen blend to 700 homes. And Italy has also trialed um, putting hydrogen into their existing network. So as I say, the advantage of this is we're reusing this huge asset that we have under the ground, which is our gas distribution networks, which transfers energy around and distributes it to homes. Uh, so if we can put hydrogen in these systems, then that is an asset that we can continue to use. Okay, that's everything that I had to tell you. So I'll hand back to Shruti and I see that we've got some questions coming up already.